everybody and welcome back to my channel. If you don't know me, my name is Lauren and I'm a recent university graduate and I like to film about my life. Today I'm going to be filming a video that is very, very overdue. Um, if you've been watching my videos for a little bit now, uh, I'm sure you've heard me talk about hospital appointments and infusions and going to the hospital and all of that good stuff and today I'm going to tell you why. Um, I feel like it's going to be a very long video, so grab a cup of tea, grab a snack, and let's crack on. If you've come over from my blog, um, you probably already know this about me, but if you haven't, I'm just going to uh, explain it to you now. So, um, seven years ago, on the 10th of May, I was diagnosed with um, an autoimmune disease called juvenile dermatomyositis, or um, JDM as it's otherwise known. After months and months of pain and exhaustion, to put it lightly, uh, I was finally diagnosed on the 10th of May. And before I crack on with the whole story of my diagnosis, uh, let me just explain to you what juvenile dermatomyositis is. So I've taken um, the description of juvenile dermatomyositis, obviously I know what it is, but uh, to word it better, I've taken um, the definition, if you will, from the American University of something. I'll type it at the bottom, because I've forgotten what it's called, um, just so you know. I have got notes on it on my lap as well, so if I'm looking down, I'm looking at that. So. Juvenile dermatomyositis is an autoimmune inflammatory disease that affects um, three in every million children in the UK a year. So on the website, this is how they've um, explained the symptoms. Uh, so it says, those who are diagnosed with it can experience varying symptoms from mild muscle weakness, which um, results in a difficulty getting out of a chair, turning over in bed to severe weakness where um, they, I explain it as practically paralysed, you can't do anything by yourself. It could also um, mean that you would have difficulty swallowing because the muscles down the side of your throat uh, either aren't there or aren't strong enough to push the food down your throat once you've finished chewing it. JDM also affects the skin it can cause redness and rashes and in the most severe cases it can cause ulceration. So just like anything, every patient experiences um, JDM differently. Um, in the more severe cases, um, patients are less re receptive to treatment. And at the moment, the cause of JDM is currently unknown. Um, there are a lot of unknowns when it comes to the cause, the cure, where it comes from, um, they know how to treat it, but they don't know how to cure it as of yet. Although the cause is currently unknown, there is a theory that suggests that the body's immune system mistakenly directs um, inflammation towards the skin, the muscle, and the blood vessels, uh, which then results in redness, weakness and exhaustion. So now that the technical stuff is out of the way, um, I'm going to share with you what my experience with JDM was like. So like I said, I was diagnosed in May 2012, but I started experiencing symptoms in about the November of 2011. Um, my first symptoms was uh, a rash across my knuckles. Um, it was like a scaly rash with like black dots almost in it. I explained it as it looked like dragon skin, which is really attractive, just across all of my knuckles, um, both here and here. Um, it also causes an excess of skin around your nail beds, um, so the, the, I don't know if it's the white bit, I don't know. You know the bit that sometimes it like peels a little bit and it, it's really sore? Um, is that bit around the nail that grows um, more than it would normally. And then in January of 2012, I started to notice that I couldn't straighten my arms properly um, and that they were really sore to like bend and straighten. So 
I don't know if you can see, but at the moment my arm, sorry, I'm holding a makeup brush because I like to hold stuff uh, when I'm talking, my arm at the moment isn't straight. Most of the time my arms aren't straight and in the January, well, as a result of the JDM, and in the January of 2012, I think my arm was about here and I physically couldn't push it down, I couldn't straighten it myself. Nobody could straighten it for me, it was just fixed in that position and it felt like every time I would try and straighten my arm out it felt like my muscles were being pulled and if they, like as if they were going to tear if someone did straighten my arm out. And alongside that in the January I started experiencing some exhaustion. Um, I am known to be tired a lot of the time, I, I think I'm, well I don't think, I know I mention it a lot in my weekly videos that I'm tired and when I've had a busy week it really comes out in my exhaustion. My camera just turned off, I don't know why. Um, where was I? So yeah, my arms had now bent fully to a 90 degree angle and I couldn't straighten them at all. And I'd started experiencing a lot of pain in my thighs and in my knees. Um, I explain the pain to people as you know how your thighs feel after you've done a really good leg day at the gym and they're really really tight and it's, you struggle to walk upstairs and to like sit down and to sit on the toilet and all that stuff, TMI I know but that's how it felt every single day. I couldn't rely, funnily, it sounds funny now, but I couldn't rely on my legs to keep me up because the muscles were just deteriorating without me even knowing it so my knees were giving way underneath me. I had fallen over and collapsed quite a lot, um, I used to do, well at the time I was doing GCSE PE, so that was a massive struggle because I was already exhausted and my body already was struggling massively but then when it came to like circuits and things I just couldn't hold myself up and there was this one time I remember more than anything else, I've always been accident prone, I've always been known to always hurt myself and like be on crutches or be in a cast, like that's always been the case. But we were doing circuits in PE and we were doing box jumps but you had to jump up to a high box, down and then up to a lower box that was still high. And I remember I jumped up and I jumped down and as soon as I hit the floor my knees just wiped me out underneath me and I just completely collapsed to the ground. Um, and it was scary because I didn't know what my body was doing. I've always been an active person Growing up I was on a lot of sports teams. I used to play netball, hockey, used to do athletics, gymnastics, cheerleading Like I've, I've done a lot of sports. So for me all of a sudden to not be able to complete a circuit and to not know why was weird and quite scary. Over those four months from January to April my exhaustion rapidly got really really bad. My appetite had shrunk hugely and I started to look unwell as a lot of people and teachers liked to point out to me. I knew I was unwell but I didn't know what it was but I get a lot of do you feel okay? Are you alright? Like should you be in school today? And I'm like well yeah like there's nothing wrong with me as far as I know at this point. Um, but Part of that was because I physically found it really difficult to keep myself awake. I would fall asleep at break time, on the table, at lunch time. I'd go home and go to bed really, really early to be ready for the next day and it was just getting worse and worse and worse and we didn't really have any answers why. And then it turned into a bit of a cycle. I had lost quite a bit of weight because I wasn't eating as much because I didn't have the appetite and obviously I'd lost a lot of muscle mass at this point and I was quite muscular before um, and yeah I fell into a bit of a cycle I for example I'd go into school on the Monday and do a full day at school um, come home and be too exhausted to go in on the Tuesday so I would stay home and try and recharge myself go in on the Wednesday not be strong enough or have enough energy to go in on the Thursday and then go in on the Friday so that cycle sort of started uh, and that's really when I started having a lot of blood tests so I've always had blood tests because I used to have a low platelet count which is the white blood cells I think in your body they were low um, so I started 
going back and forth to the doctors, having blood tests um, to try and figure out what was going on. So May the 10th slowly came around after a lot of falling asleep at school and not eating that much, going back and forth to the doctors and we went to see my GP. There's this one um, day where I was in that cycle and I'd gone into school because I had a couple of mock exams. I think it was my mock physics exam. And we were on our way to the exam hall in our main hall in school and we were walking down this corridor and I remember just brick bursting into tears because I had no energy to do anything. I really didn't feel well and I didn't know why. So I was taken to key stage four um, and put in a little like office room and was told I had all the time I wanted to complete these mock exams. Um, so I tried my best. I think I fell asleep a few times because obviously I was so exhausted. So by this time um, I'd gone to see my GP and both of my parents were with me at the time and I was told to go straight to our local hospital and that there was a bed there and that they were waiting for me um, because my blood tests had come back and they were very 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 high, dangerously high. It turns out that if my bloods were monitored a lot closer then they would have been able to see the levels going up and up and up month by month. So um, there are these things in your body called antibodies and they fight off infection. So there's between 22 and 180 antibodies in your body at any one time and when you're not very well those levels peak a little bit um, because your body produces more in order to fight off the infection. When I was diagnosed I had 40,000 antibodies in my body and by this point they there wasn't any infection to fight off so they just continued to multiply and started eating up my muscles and that's why my muscles were breaking down, that's why I was losing a lot of muscle mass, that's why I was exhausted because my body was compensating for the muscles that weren't there by working twice as hard to do the things that I would usually do. This meant that um, I couldn't get myself out of bed, I couldn't lift my head off a pillow I couldn't stand up from a chair by myself, I couldn't get up off the floor, I couldn't get up off the toilet, I couldn't walk up the stairs. Um, I think the time when my mum really noticed that it was taking a toll on my body was when I'd come home, home from school and I used to live in a converted bungalow and so it had like a step into the house and I physically couldn't lift my leg off the floor to put it on the step to get into the house, it was just so so difficult because I did again I didn't have the muscle mass there to do that for me. So once I got to the hospital I was pretty much diagnosed straight away I think within a couple of hours being there they diagnosed me with juvenile dermatomyositis and the thing is with JDM is every person who's training to be a doctor learns about it and reads about it but because it's so rare most doctors will never see it um, and that's why my GPs couldn't diagnose me, um, but as soon as I got to the hospital they knew what it was. And yeah, so I stayed in my local hospital for I think like two or three days? Two, two nights I think, and three days, something like that. And then I was transferred to the University College Hospital of Wales, which is the Heath, to be closer to a consultant who, a rheumatology consultant. So as soon as I got to UHW or the Heath, um, I was put straight on IV fluids. I was on IV fluids at the local hospital that I was at, just as a preventative measure, just to make sure that my kidneys were okay, just to flush all the toxins out of my kidneys. And scans and tests pretty much started straight away. Obviously your heart is a muscle, and where JDM is a muscle, based autoimmune disease. Um, I had to have heart function tests to make sure that that was okay, lung function tests, I had like eating tests where they would give me toast 
and I'd have to like chew it and then when I would swallow it they'd put a stethoscope on my throat to make sure that the muscles um, in my throat were working okay. Um, CT scans, MRI scans, a full body MOT basically and then once I'd met up with my consultant for the first time I was put on as well as the IV fluids um, an IV steroid so I was put on 180 milligrams of prednisolone um, this would act sort of as an immune system it suppressed my immune system hugely but um, this would fight the antibodies to restore them to like a, na a normal natural level within my body to stop them eating my muscles and I was referred to Great Ormond Street Hospital because there was a consultant up there who uh, has seen JDM across the world so I went up to see her and I would go up to Great Ormond Street quite a lot. I didn't start going until the July or the August of 2012 and I would see her and some other nurses up there who were also familiar with JDM. There's this one nurse called Polly who was amazing. We are now connected on LinkedIn and yeah I was back and forth there for a really long time um, until basically until I became an adult and I started being seen at UCL which is uh, where I go now for my infusions so when I went up to Great Ormond Street we started another course of treatment um, which is another IV uh, infusion of a medication called infliximab and they give that medication to people with rheumatoid arthritis and it sort of lubricates my muscles and gives me a bit more energy so in the beginning I was on that every two weeks and then that extended to every four weeks and it just kept extending and now I have it every eight weeks and given that I don't relapse this year hopefully the dosage will go down and I can start coming off it but that is all dependent on whether I relapse or not at Christmas time. So fingers crossed that doesn't happen because it would be really great to start coming off medication now seven years later. So given how chronic my JDM was at this point I was actually only in hospital for a week, um, just over a week including the local hospital stay and then I got to go home so as I said earlier I used to live in a converted bungalow my mum and dad's bedroom was downstairs and then mine and Alex's bedroom were upstairs but we swapped, I say we, my dad and my brother swapped my room for the dining room so that turned into my bedroom by the time I got home and I basically lived in there for about a week and then we moved house not only did we just move house, but we moved from a converted bungalow to a three-storey townhouse and I couldn't even get myself out of a chair. So that was fun, but before I left the hospital I was given a lot of aids by them, so I was given a wheelchair which I was heavily reliant on for what felt like the longest time. Um, I couldn't walk more than about three to five steps without being exhausted um, so I was in a wheelchair I had been given like a backrest it looked like um, like a sunbed when you go on holiday on the beach and you lift the top up and then it pops into like a little hole in the in the back it was like that without the body it was just the back of it and I would put it in my bed so I would sleep pretty much sat upright I put it on the sofa so I could sit down and be comfortable and not be swallowed up because we used to have a really soft sofa and I, if I was swallowed up by that sofa I wouldn't have been able to move myself out of it or into a more comfortable position and again TMI but I was given um, a raised toilet seat because then it's not as far for me to get down and to get back up from and I was given like a bench that you tie on to the side of your bath so I could sit down while I was having a shower and by this time obviously I had missed all in all pre-summer holidays I had missed every week of school from the 10th of May till the end of term so when I went back I was given my predicted grades for my mock 
exams and when I went back in the September oh no I don't think I went back in September I'm not sure I might have but when I eventually went back I w went in for one day one morning a week no one like early afternoon a week so I'd go in for 12 o'clock and my dad or my mum would pick me up at about half one two so I wasn't in for very long at all because that was too draining but uh, I dropped a lot of my GCSE subjects I think I came out with eight GCSEs in the end instead of about 11 or 12 and uh, I was given so much support from my school my school were absolutely incredible I rave about them to everyone because they're just the best people ever I 100% wouldn't have been able to get through my the rest of my school career so from year 11 to year 13 without the support that I got from them uh, we still talk now they I I can't talk highly of them enough if that makes sense <laughs> but yeah they were incredible and although it was a really horrendous time obviously I didn't really see it like that at the time I don't think I ever really took it very seriously I don't know if that was a coping mechanism or whether that was just how I saw it and I still don't I do take it seriously obviously I look after myself but I didn't see it as like this big thing I my mum was in conversation with a couple of the support teachers from my school and they were talking about um, dropping subject and like only going to classes in the buildings that had lifts because I couldn't get up the stairs and this was in the May and I was and they were talking about September and I was like oh no I'll be fine by then like you don't need to do that that's way over the top like, I don't want to draw attention to myself but I 100% needed it I didn't realize how long the process of being mobile again would take I think it took almost a year for me to be fully mobile again um, after a lot of physiotherapy, hydrotherapy, a lot exercise, swimming, it took a lot, it took an army basically to get me back to being fighting fit. But yeah, given how horrendous the time was um, at that moment, I had so much support from friends, family, like I said, my teacher, my, my teachers. My family were absolutely incredible, um, both of my parents acted pretty much as my carers for a lot of that time, um, my mum took a lot of time off work and just to stay home with me because I wouldn't have been able to survive if I was left home alone, um, but yeah she would shower me, she would take me to the bathroom if I needed to go to the toilet she would pick me up out of bed, she would pick me up off a chair, she'd get me in the car, she'd get me out of the car, she'd get me in my wheelchair, she'd push me around, she'd take me to hospital appointments. On the days then when my mum did start going back to work, my dad did exactly the same, and he did it a lot of the time, they both did like equally as much. But and before my brother went to university, he used to carry me up the stairs, so he'd get on all fours at the bottom of the stairs. And I just like hook myself on him and he would like crawl up the stairs and then he went decided it was a good idea to go to university so then my mum had to do that and she's a tiny little human so that was a good workout um, but yeah they were absolutely incredible my friends would come over to see me all the time Rebecca I think came over pretty much every day she would straighten my hair for me because she knows how I like to have my hair straightened um, she'd catch me up on school gossip she would just chill out with me and what I loved about that time as well is nobody everybody obviously asked how I was and stuff but nobody treated me any differently I was still who I was pre JDM and like that was I think the best thing I think I would have felt a lot more isolated if people treated me as if I was some sort of like charity case that you know needed help all of a sudden because I've always been very independent and very strong-willed so while I was in hospital I was still on those IV fluids and I was still on IV prednisolone I think it was 180 milligrams uh, for the entire week that I was there and then when I came out they took me down from 180 milligrams to 90 milligrams um, 
but this meant that I was taking 18 tablets, steroid tablets a day. I take nine in the morning, nine in the night, as well as two ranitidine tablets to make sure that, um, to protect my stomach basically, to make sure that my stomach didn't burn away. Um, and obviously then I was injecting myself with the methotrexate once a week and taking ondansetron to stop the nausea for that. I actually liked taking ondansetron because the tablets tasted like white chocolate and white chocolate is my favourite chocolate. One thing they did tell me while I was in hospital was that the steroids would make me put on weight and increase my appetite. Um, it puts on a lot of water weight and I 100% did not believe that when I was in hospital. I was like, no it won't, I'll be fine, I eat really healthily, it's cool. But boy was I wrong, I went, I can't remember my exact weight, but I put on I think four and a half stone in a month. It was intense, it was uncomfortable. Obviously I'm far more recovered than I was, obviously not cured because there isn't a cure at the minute. Um, and I still do relapse from time to time and pretty much each year I get the same aches and pains and stiffness and exhaustion every now and again but it's just something that I'm still learning to deal with, still learning to manage day to day. Um, the annoying thing is you don't know that you've pushed yourself too far until you've pushed yourself too far. So it's just getting a grip, getting to grips with that and knowing where my limits are and I think I've pretty much covered everything so thank you so much for watching if you've got through the whole video uh, I really really appreciate it um, if you do have any more questions don't be scared to just pop them in the comments below or send me a DM on Instagram um, I'd love to make more videos about this I think more people need to know about it um, not every illness is visible obviously and yeah so don't forget to smash that subscribe button um, it would really make me happy my Instagram and my Twitter are linked down below as always and I'll leave some uh, website links down below if you're interested in finding out a bit more about JDM um, but again thank you so much for watching and I will see you very very soon bye